2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 7 reads, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, destroy arguments, and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Verse number seven, look at what is before you. If anyone is confident that he is in Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is in Christ, so also are we. The goal of the weapons of our warfare is to take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the second weapon of our warfare. The first one last week was faith. This one is obedience. Jesus, I come to you. I ask for help. Holy Spirit, would you come? We pray this in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody says, I have to just give a quick introduction here because I think sometimes in the church, if we don't pause and we don't talk about the gift of salvation and then what we're supposed to walk out in obedience and sanctification, that sometimes we can talk as though they're the same thing when really they're not. You know, Romans 10, 9, and 10 talks about belief and confession. Uh, we read scriptures that read, uh, it is by grace through faith by which we are saved. We believe at this church that uh, we don't believe in a works-based salvation. It's God's grace and his gift, and it's our job to receive. Having said that, is there requirements, is, I'm going to ask the, the, to go a little deep here today, is there requirements of obedience in salvation? Some people would say yes. The moment that you say yes to that question, then you put the disclaimer of saying faith um, that we can have faith in Jesus, and it's not by our works. But the moment that you say obedience, you are putting a work requirement to salvation. Amen. And so we have this we have this double speak that oftentimes comes from the pulpit, as though our salvation can be earned through obedience, our salvation can be earned through works, and then we say no, we don't believe that. But then we read scriptures that say we can't be forgiven if we don't forgive. I want you to lock in with me this morning, right? So is it is it is it free or is it not free? Is it salvation based upon faith through grace, or is, it, or is it, hey, I've got to walk this thing out in obedience? And largely, the large part of what's wrong with the American church, I believe, is how low we've, we've taken the bar to actually say that you're a Christian. You know, us pastors are guilty of this. If you, if you wink right now at me, I promise you a good life, and I promise you prosperity, and I promise you an, an overcoming life, only to walk in your Christian walk to get hit in the face by life and its circumstances, and to know that your Christian walk is not a cruise ship, it's more like a battleship. Those of us that have black eyes in our Christian walk, we know that, right? Um, and, and Paul writes this quite often, and they use this analogy of, of fighting the good fight and, and being a warrior and suiting yourself up in the armor of God, and, and you read these phrases in Scripture, the weapons of our warfare. You'll find as you start reading Scripture very clearly that the Bible is not trying to hide something from you to tell you that it's all going to be good and gravy. That the Bible is actually telling you the moment that you step into salvation in this thing we call the Christian walk, you, you, you better outfit yourself with some weapons because the enemy doesn't want the seed of the gospel to go deep inside of you to actually bring yourself to a life of victory and fruit. You know, the Bible college questions that we would ask students as, as I taught Bible college for 10 or 11 years is, according to Romans 10, 9, and 10, it's belief in confession, right? Belief in your heart, confess with your mouth. Well, what do you do with people that can't, can't speak? They're mute. The, are they not allowed to be saved? Well, the short answer is no. You know, no, obviously no. Confession then becomes something that is not necessarily words out of your mouth, but an example or a life of saying, I'm going towards him with my life. And God, I believe, doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the inward appearance. And so we got to be careful in the church that we don't judge people's walk. Um, I believe that there's going to be a lot of people that when we get to heaven, that we're going to look over to them and we're going to go, oh, you made it? <laughs> Some of you in this room, right? <laughs> don't look to your neighbor. Don't look to your spouse. Don't look to your kids. It's so wrong. Like, like you made it. I believe as a pastor when I read scripture that God's grace and mercy um, is, is able to be understood, but man, it's hard to understand. 
Because when I think about the gift that is Jesus, what he did on that cross, you know, how he rose from the dead so that I can have victory, and that it's, it's a whosoever gospel, it's a simple gospel. The recognition that I'm a sinner, that I need, I need Jesus to save me, and I need him to save me in a big and mighty way. Some of us, you know, we, we, we recognize, and if, if, if you've been saved for a long time, you, you better be careful that you do not forget where he found you. It's one of the greatest mistakes that we make in, in the church is those of us that have been walking with decades with the Lord, we can get this holier-than-thou attitude, this religious mindset. And, and it, it's you got to be careful, ready for this one, that you, that you don't believe that the church should be restorative, but we're only restorative to strangers, not people that we know. Don't we have a lot of grace for strangers, but the moment that God asks us to, to have grace for people that are sitting to the left or right of us, we start going, well, they should have known. They should have known better. They should have done this. They should have done that. No, it's our job as a believer to, to love and to serve and to give and to forgive 70 times 7 and to walk in this, in this path. And so I, I wanted to make sure that, that, we, that you have some, some baseline for what I'm talking about with obedience because I believe that the gift of salvation, if we're not careful, we will tie works to it and make it a condition even when we're not trying to make it a condition. Are you tracking with me? Salvation is this, is this free gift. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll talk to, to people that are in their throes of addiction. They're, they're in, their, in their moments, and most Christians in America today will say, that person's not making heaven. But when you talk to them, there is a belief and confession in their life in Jesus. What we're saying is, is that they have not walked out the victory that's promised in salvation. What we're not saying is that they're not saved. We're not the judge and jury. I mean, there's a lot of people in the church that want to judge people's uh, now and their present to their future. And that's what that scripture means by judge not lest you be judged. Because in the same manner that you judge, you'll be judged in return. And so you got to be careful that when, when you're in this moment of process, and it's important to understand when I start talking about obedience, that if salvation is surrender, surrendering my will to his will, I can't earn it, I give it to you, I recognize that I have a great need, and that need can only be filled by belief and confession through Jesus. It's by grace through faith we are saved. Surrender, if surrender is, is salvation is through surrender, listen to me, victory in my walk with Jesus is through obedience. There are a lot of people that will blame God for their current situation when really their disobedience needs to be blamed. Lord, why aren't you healing me when I don't work out, I don't go to the gym, I overeat, I drink Cokes and, 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 and Doritos, and I, Lord, I know I have diabetes, but why aren't you healing me as I stuff myself with, with Cheetos and Snickers? Come on, somebody. Don't look at me while you're nodding your head, all right? What we're saying then is if we're not careful is we'll start putting the blame on God and the outcomes of our life based upon our disobedience. God, why aren't you blessing my finances? And he says, I've given you the path for blessing to be in your finances by generosity and being content with what you live with. Come on, somebody. So you, so we, in the church, if you're not careful, we'll put require. So. God's love for us never changes. We know that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. God loves us. But oftentimes we don't speak, listen to me, we don't speak of our love for him. If you love me, what, what does it say? You'll keep my commandments. And so the anointing, this is a very important lesson for our church, the anointing, the freedom spirit, the revival spirit, the, 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 the anointing, think of Samson, the anointing, is tied to our obedience in the disciplines that he's given us to walk out kingdom truths. So th the Lord gave Samson some requirements. Don't cut your hair or don't drink anything or don't, you know, it, there were some requirements. As long as he lived underneath those requirements, he walked in a strength that was above a man's strength. It was God's strength. The moment that he broke those requirements, the strength was gone. The church wants to know where the anointing is that breaks bondages. The church wants to know where, where the power of God is in church services, where the power of God is in the gifts of the Spirit. And God is saying, I'm going to withhold the gifts until you give me the fruits. We have to get to a place to where we recognize, getting a little deep this morning, we have to get to a place 
till we recognize the importance of our obedience as it lends itself to victory. This doesn't, this doesn't mean that we should get scared or, or, or mindful of the fact that, you know, God knows that we aren't going to be perfect. Uh, righteousness is not perfection in our, in, our, in, our own, in our own ability. Righteousness is saying, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you. David, who failed many times, was, was known as a, a, a man after God's own heart. Why? Because when he recognized his failures, what did he do? He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Re- return to me the joy of my salvation. And so you have to understand the baseline of this, this message of the weapons of our warfare is recognizing how important our obedience is. Lord, would you send me a godly wife and would you give me godly children, yet I'm going to go do things that are ungodly. I'm going to go meet my wife at the club. I'm going to go meet my wife at the bar. But Lord, would you give me a godly wife? We, we blame God for the lack when God is saying, I've given you weapons to fight in this battle, to walk in victory, and it's going to require obedience. So I need everyone in this room to give me permission this morning to step on some toes. Is that okay? I know I already, I know I already started, but I mean, we'll go there. Let me give you the recap of 2 Corinthians, those 10 and 11, 12 chapters. Paul was exampling what it meant to advance the kingdom. The kingdom principle is, is true. No forward motion goes untested. The moment that you, isn't it amazing? The moment that you start saying, Lord, I'm going all in, it's like all hell breaks loose. I, I, I had a gentleman um, this last week tell me this incredible story. I was, I was down front one, uh, one Sunday morning after service, and this gentleman came up to me, and the Lord prompted me to give some dollars to him. Now, you can come running up here. I don't have very many dollars today. But that day I had a little bit of money in my pocket and I felt like the Lord placed it on my heart to give. And I didn't give to be able to share the story, but I thought this was so profound. And this man saw, oversaw me and he, and he came into my office a week or two ago and he had some cash. And he said, Pastor, I felt so convicted by watching you minister to that man that I, it's been a long time or if ever I've ever given money to a stranger. And I, I said, if my pastor can do it, then why can't I do it? And so here's some dollars. And the only requirement on these dollars is I just want you to bless somebody. And the moment, listen to me, the moment that he does that, there's an attack on his home. And we've been, over the last four or five days, ministering to him and their family in the hospital. I tell you that because it is a kingdom truth that no forward motion goes untested. The moment you tell yourself in the spirit, I'm I'm not missing church anymore. I'm, I'm, I, am, I am going to go in on the things of God, and I'm going to walk into church leadership or servanthood. I'm going to go to the next level. I'm going to walk in the giftings and callings that God's placed on me. By and large, the, the moment that you decide that, you might as well just look up because it's getting ready to fall. And that's not to scare you. It's to tell you a kingdom truth that it's in that resistance that you face that your prayers are being answered. Because the moment that you go through testings and trials, the enemy thinks that he's winning, but little does he know he's creating a strength in you that you have prayed and asked for to beat the enemy. So the goal of Christianity is not just to win battles, but it's to win the ground. There's a lot of us that are content with winning the battle when God wants us to win the victory and win the ground. So many of us, we get to the battle that we win and we're so spiritually exhausted that we allow the enemy just to move back into that place. That's not victory in the kingdom. Victory in the kingdom is not only do I have the ability to fight battles, I have the ability to win battles and then keep the ground that the enemy is trying to steal. It's that kingdom principle. It is in the testing that strength and endurance and patience to win the battle and keep the ground is formed. It's why in the book of James, it it talks about Rejoice when you fall into various trials and temptations for the testing of your faith will produce patience and patience will bring about every good work. That if you want to be a believer that walks in victory, you have to welcome the testing and trial in your life. If our church ever wants to grow and experience revival, we need to welcome the discipline of the Lord that's found through conviction to take our disobedience to obedience Because it's in the obedience that the anointing flows and falls. So we we can't be scared of the discipline or testing or the discipleship or the disciplines that need to be created in our life to become the people that God's called us. So Paul was under heavy scrutiny from the people he was called to reach. 
We learned last week that carnality will always oppose faith, even in the church. There is nothing like when a missionary comes to your church that is on the front lines and is talking to you about the sacrifices that he's making, the obedience that he's walking in, but also the victory that he's attaining. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a sermon or a service where a missionary comes in that convicts the snot out of you about how you're living. I mean, I get convicted quite often. Like when I, we had our missions convention and I was talking to the missionaries. Uh, we had a day before where we just all got together. I felt like I got in that car and I was doing nothing for God. Like they were talking about, you know, for, for the last year we've been persecuted and one person came to Jesus and we rejoice and, and my, my kids haven't, uh, they don't have any friends and, and they're just talking about their life, but they're not doing it in a complaining way. They're doing it in an obedient to the will of God way and there is something about the joy that missionaries bring. And so listen to me, if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you will run from that kind of conviction and you'll hang around people, you'll be part of a church that will only ever try to make you comfortable. What does the Bible say in the last day? That, they, that they will, there will be a people that will try to heap it in themselves, teachers that will just scratch their ear. Make me comfortable. Make sure the temperature's in the right spot. Make it, make it so that I, I, I acknowledge it, and, and, and it's, it's something that I understand, that it doesn't press me past a place of, of, of being going from comfortable to uncomfortable. The truth is, the last thing that you need is a church that wants to um, agree with the comfortable or complacency in your life. You should get yourself around fellow believers that challenge you that challenge you to go to a deeper place, that challenge you. And there's nothing like different gift mixes in the church. People that challenge you by the way that they think. The people that are prophetic in this house, they challenge me. I know that's real. I know it's a gift, but it challenges me. There's teachers in this, in, in this, in this gift that are gifted to teach the word of God. They challenge this pastor heart in a good way. Because this pastor, man, it, it, it is my, it is, I know my weakness, is I just believe in everybody and everything. Oh, so-and-so's got this as they're like walking in spiritually with like, you know, two crutches and four broken arms. I'm like, you're going to make it. And the teacher's like, well, they're probably not going to make it if they continue to do that. So it is in that gift mix of diversity in the church that, that obedience really does get fleshed out. I love Paul's response. It was beautiful. I love you enough to be convicted about what God has called me to, and I'm not going anywhere. And the thing that we must never forget is this. Our critics are also our mission field. A lot of times we'll, we'll, we in the church will, will be scared of people who will come up to us and criticize our belief systems or our convictions when really we should welcome the criticism as criticism or testings and trials are a way to strengthen the things that we are convicted about. So if all you ever do is hang out in circles that... that that agree with your disobedience or agree with your lack or agree with the things that you're not good at, you will never be fleshed out to a place of conviction. And the kind of church that I want to be a part of is where we don't view people that give us their opinion as critics. We view them as our mission field. I am called as a brother and sister in Christ that if I'm wrong biblically or doctrinally to admit it, to say the Lord showed me some things that maybe I didn't. I don't know if you guys have ever looked back on your first journals that you wrote as a Christian. And how wrong you really were. I remember looking back on the first several sermons that I preached. And I was like, did I say that publicly? <laughs> the, kind of, the kind of grace that we have as a body to grow ourselves to obedience. And there is no one that is off limits to accountability, including the pastor. In, including the leadership of the church. But I, I, I love the fact that Paul addressed the complaints I have it in my sermon notes. If you guys want to go there, I don't have time this morning to go in there. But he addressed the complaints in such a way where he taught us how to answer those that are critical of our faith and still bring them along in the mission field. But in the end, the criticisms that they were trying to help him overcome were largely a carnal criticism that were trying to get the Apostle Paul to become more palatable in his teaching. Because they thought the more palatable that he was, the more influence that he would have. 
They question his leadership ability. They question his communication skills. They question his source of where he got his, they, they question where he was actually rooted in. They question, in, they question how he boasted in the Lord. They question him and they thought that they were helping, but the Apostle Paul knew that it's not my job to obey your criticisms. It's my, it's my job to obey the, the voice of the Lord that I hear in my life and be instructed and that is going to be my source. So our job, listen to me, our job is not trying to get faith-filled Christians to be more carnal. Our job is to get carnal Christians to be more faith-filled. It's not, it's not our job as, 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 as a ministers or people. It's not my job as a, as a believer to say, Lord, would you make it more comfortable for me so that I can learn how to live with my strongholds? Lord, would you disrupt me in a place to where I get so righteously upset that the strongholds in my life have to leave? The marriage that I'm living with, that I'm married on paper, but I'm divorced in my heart. Lord, would you convict me to get to the place of honoring my spouse? Would you, would you convict me that my first job is not to be my children's friend, but it's to be their parents? Lord, would you, would you help me? Would you help me be a believer that you've called me to be? Would you help me to understand that it is the husband or the father that's to be the leader of the home? Would you help me to understand the biblical principles and truths, though that they might be uncomfortable to the trends of culture? We, we, are not, we are not of those that want to be carnal and adopt the philosophies of the world that in the end, listen to me, that in the end will leave your family in a spiritual defeated state. But it's the goal of the church to, to, to hold this biblical truth up and say, this, has, this is enough and it's always been enough. And as for me and my house, we're going to live in the obedience of the word of God that's going to walk me to victory. I've been having conversations with a lot of wonderful people about what is deep. What is, what is the deep things of God? Is the deep things of God knowledge or obedience or both? There are a lot of people that will study scripture to know what the longest chapter of the Bible is or who the oldest person was and they they will, they will look to facts. I remember being in Bible college and reading the book, uh, Jewish Customs and Manners. And that's important to understand Bible in context. I want you to listen to this heart of mine as a pastor. It is okay to go deep into the Word of God. We should be students of the Word of God. But if you measure your spiritual victory by your depth of knowledge in deep knowledge but don't have deep obedience, you're wrong. There are a lot of people that are puffed up by human knowledge and philosophy only to have train wrecks as a marriage, train wrecks in relationship, train wrecks with their children, and they know a lot about the word of God but have never learned what it takes to walk in obedience. So what we have to learn how to do is we have to learn as a believer to be walking in, and found in a place of deep obedience, rooted in love, and found in faith. I believe that, this, that God's calling this church not just to a place of deep knowledge, but to a place of deep obedience. Obedience to a place of, of not just saying it, but acting it out. I believe that we need a kind of faith and obedience that moves mountains, and not a kind of faith and disobedience where mountains move us. That's a lot of the faith that we have in the church today. Oh Lord, if you would, if, you, if it's your will, if you would have, should have, could have. If you want to, if you, you're my genie, God, would you grant the request? And we, we know what the word of God says about certain strongholds in our life, yet then when we go to ask God, we're defeated by the strongholds that we've been living in. They're never going to change. They're never going to move. I believe what God is calling us to is the kind of faith and obedience that moves mountains it's not, and not the kind of faith and disobedience where mountains move us. Here's what they thought in their criticisms to Paul. Philosophies about his reach and influence could be more if he just diluted his message and delivery. It's a lot about what the philosophy that runs the American church. It's, it's, it's not that we never come and, and, and approve from the pulpit as American preachers certain actions that we don't just mention them. We don't talk about holiness anymore. We, we, don't, we don't talk about uh, being sober-minded and vigilant. 
We, we, we don't talk about what it means to walk in sanctification and taking things out of our life that, that maybe aren't necessarily sin, but they are weights that easily beset us. We don't talk about the love of money and the greed of, of a dad that, that works 60 and 70 hours a week, but is out of balance in his home. We don't, we, don't, we don't talk about those things because the moment the pastors start talking about those things, most people in the American church go, well, I've got to go to the place where I get more comfortable because this is just too uncomfortable, these, these kinds of truths. The kind of body of Christ that God is calling Parkway to is that we ain't scared. And not only are we not scared of the biblical truths, we're not going to stop because we can't stop, won't stop. Because if we want to live in true victory in our community, there are things that we're going to have to call sin, sin. There are things that we're going to have to pursue in righteousness that are going to be uncomfortable. And we cannot cloud. Listen to me. We are, we are walking into 2024, one of the most divisive political environments in probably recent history. I mean, when you think about what our nation is going to face in the next 10 months, even some of you are getting easy, uneasy right now as, as your pastor is talking about politics. It, listen to me, it's not that, the, it's not that the, the church needs to become more political, it's that the, the politics have become more biblical. They want to redefine marriage. They want to murder innocent babies. They want to, they, 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 they want to have addictions be widespread all over our nation. And the, the church doesn't need to run, from, run from, some, from preaching the truth found in God's word because it's the truth that will set people free. But here's the truth. The truth is, is before you can point a finger about the disobedience in our government and in our world, you've got to point at the disobedience that's in our own life. The fact that most American church members only, only come to church 1.5 times a month. The fact that most of us aren't found in service. The fact that most of us don't tithe or give to the local body. I think 3% was a national, national thing that we, was, was the latest survey. 3% of the church actually ties. There is enough giftings and talents and resources in the church to see the move of God that's promised in every community, but what it's going to take is it's going to take a deep obedience. It's going to go from a place of I know what I'm supposed to be doing to actually walking in it and doing it. It's not a new problem. Carnal churches and carnal believers since the beginning have tried to introduce human reasoning and philosophy to the life of believers as a way to help the Spirit of God clean up dirty and wounded souls. Paul faced it. And if the Apostle Paul faced it in the new church, we're going to face it. The truth is, there's only one thing that can repair the spiritual problem of sin in our lives, and that answer is Jesus. And God sent Jesus and the Holy Spirit points to Jesus, and Jesus provides the way. See, man's philosophy will lead you from one addiction to another, one cycle to another, one church to another, one pastor to another, one worship team to another. You'll search for it on YouTube, you'll try to find it, but listen to me. There is an obedience that will lead your life to victory, but it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you to be disciplined and take off the carnal and to put on the spiritual. Listen to what Paul told his spiritual son Timothy about this war and the weapons he would need. Would you guys give me 10 or so more minutes of your time and then we'll go into a time of worship. 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20 says this. This charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may wage the good warfare. I had a friend tell me, the best fight you can have, the, the, a good fight, is a fight that you win. I've never seen someone that got beat up and said it was a good fight. This pastor, he wants you to fight the good fight. It's like, you know, you have friends that, that in high school, they would get in a fight, and they would, they would get all bloodied and black-eyed, and they would say, you should have seen the other guy. Like, I don't need to. You lost, you know? I want to be part of a, I want to be a, part of a church that fights the good fight. And the, you know what the good fight is? The good fight is the one you win. That you may wage good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which have some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. I was talking to, to a friend earlier before church about this passage of Scripture, and I just noted that, you know, Paul, one of the greatest disciples of all time, we oftentimes think about him writing two-thirds of the New Testament and, and discipling people like Timothy. But in verse number 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander, 
He says, the, these people that I've discipled have shuff, uh, suffered shipwreck, whom I deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. The truth is, is that Paul, even Paul, in his discipling, came across people when they counted the cost to be in victory and obedience, struggled with holding on to their disobedience rather than the obedience. That's why my pastor growing up would always tell me, son, you're better off leaving the church and going trying what the world has to offer than coming to church and then doing the church thing and then doing the world thing because what you're going to do is you're going to cause your conscience or that thing inside of you to become so dull that God can't speak in conviction to you because you've ignored it so many times. It's a kingdom truth. The truth is, is that, listen to me, if you walk into church, and I'm glad that you're here, but if you've never had a pastor, if you've never had someone disciple you in this way, if you want to walk in victory, you have to welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you're going to have to understand that some moments in your Christian walk are going to be uncomfortable, but I want you to listen to me. Oh, it's worth it. To hold the hand of your wife that you've been married to for 21 years and you've stared death in the face, hearing doctors report that, they, that she wasn't going to live past six months or nine months, to have to go walk the dialysis wing, to, to, to walk through a season where they said your son was never going to walk again, to, to have Jace who came out blue and was was basically not breathing and, and had a death sentence on his life. But man, when you walk in the obedience of the word of God and you get to hold, listen to me, you get to hold close the miracles that God's given you, what a beautiful thing it is. What a beautiful thing it is to not just hold close the miracles, but to even, even look at like my father who passed away 10 or 11 years ago and knowing that the enemy robbed my father of many years that he was supposed to live but also not getting so bitter and upset with God that I, I can't serve him and know him, that my experience doesn't trump my surrender to him, that know that he's a good father, that yes, life is hard, but he's also a good father, that no matter where you find yourself at today, if you find yourself in the throes of disappointment or the joys of victory, that he's a good father, that if you will just walk this thing out in obedience, even the bad things that happen to you as a believer, the word of God says that he works all things together for good for those that are loved and are called according to his purpose. What a beautiful thing that is. The picture here is beautiful. Paul was going to teach not just the philosophy of the faith to Timothy, but was going to model the fruit and gifting of the faith. I'm not just going to teach you about the fight, Timothy, I'm going to teach you how to win the fight. Listen to what Paul told Timothy to anchor himself to. He said, anchor yourself to the prophecies previously made concerning you by the elders or by those that are in authority over you. I need to get my Pentecostal on here just for a few moments. I am thankful that we serve a God that is, that is still speaking to individuals about their destiny. Thankful. I'm thankful that in this room, God has his eyes on you, and there are things that are in your future that God has ordained you to complete, and that no person in this world was birthed by accident, but you have a purpose. And the purpose is findable, and it's knowable. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that we serve a God that's still speaking. There are those that are in our, even our own community, in our own world, in our own nation, that believe that the apostolic gifts have ended. The five-fold ministry gift is over. The giftings that are found in 1 Corinthians 12, the words of knowledge and the words of wisdom. There are some that would teach in cessationism that God has done speaking to his people. But I want to I want to just get I want to get into some 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 deep ends as I close this morning. Do you realize that cessationism in doctrine is no different than continuism in action if if you don't practice a thing that you believe? Let, let me explain what I, what I'm saying. A church that believes in the spiritual gifts but yet does not give place for them is no different than the cessationist who doesn't believe in them. There's no difference between an atheist who doesn't believe in God and a, and, a, and a person who believes in God that doesn't pray to him. An agnostic who doesn't read, uh, believe in the Bible and a Christian who doesn't read it. 
There's no difference between a believer who believes in Scripture that it's proper for men to lift up holy hands, but doesn't lift up holy hands. What about a shout of praise? When's the last time you gave a shout of praise to Jesus? Because that's scriptural. When's the last time you read in Psalms 150, praise the Lord in his sanctuary? Praise him with the stringed instruments and praise him with the, the cymbals, and the, not, not just the cymbals, the crashing cymbals. What's, is there any difference if we believe in the working of, the, of the, the ministry of God through Scripture, yet we don't practice them? If we don't give place to words of knowledge, listen to me, husbands, husbands, listen to me. If you believe that God can touch you in a service, but you haven't responded to a, a moment of God in a service, is there any difference between you leading your family that way or someone who doesn't believe in that, not honoring God and doing it? I, I would tell you that I, I am actually, I have more respect for the cessationist who doesn't believe in the spiritual gifts in action and doesn't practice them than the Pentecostal or the continuist who believes that those things are supposed to be present that doesn't give place for them in the church. You'll ask pastors in the town, you'll ask pastors in our nation, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? And pastors privately will tell you yes. But publicly, they'll never give opportunity for the infilling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no difference. There's no difference in, in if, we, if privately we say, Lord, we believe in healing, but publicly we never give an opportunity to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This pastor, listen to me, I'm trying to prod us to a place of obedience. That if we, if we, if we become those Christians that say it's an hour and 15 minutes and we got to get out of here because Applebee's is calling. <laughs> if we want God to fit in this little box that we put him into, yet we never walk in the obedience found in his word, we're going to miss what he has for us. And let me tell you why most, most people don't walk in the obedience. Because not only is walking out of disobedience to obedience uncomfortable, but living in obedience is uncomfortable. You know, when someone grabs the attention of the church through a, a misinformed, not well-placed word of knowledge, or someone prophesies that, that, that God's not in it. You know, that's uncomfortable because a pastor has to get up and has to rebuke. Rebuke, I don't believe, is a bad word. Rebuke is like, hey, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> and I need to teach you, and we're going to walk this journey together. But listen to me. The alternative is that our kids are raised in a church that's powerless, where we see no miracles, we see no signs, we see no wonders. The alternative is that, listen to me, as families, we get struck in our, stuck in our strongholds where we, listen to me, listen to me, listen, listen. And this is coming from a pastor who loves you. We hold on to animosity and we don't forgive. You can't get to the deep things of God until you check the box on the elementary things of God. And you know what the elementary milk things are? Loving the person to the left or right of you. Forgiving those who've done you wrong. I guess that's one. Even though I didn't ask for audience participation. <laughs> I just got honored there for a minute, I'm sorry. I'm thankful that we have the tools at our disposal that if we'll walk in obedience... We can see the victory of God. Paul told Timothy through these promises, the sense of destiny, this, this, this calling that God's placed on your life, that you're going to be encouraged to a place of knowing that God's hand on you, it's going to require that you have faith and a good conscience. Do you know that you can only have a good conscience when you're living right and in obedience? You ever have one of your kids get chocolate all over their face and you ask them if they ate the chocolate? I think many in the church, as a pitcher, if we're not careful, will come to the Lord with chocolate all over our face and we'll lift up our hands and say, Lord, would you bless me? Would you send your anointing to my church? Would you break the stronghold over my life? And if you'll listen to the Lord very calmly and very intently, he'll just lean in and say, son or daughter, 
Just stop going to the cookie jar and your life will be blessed. Allow me to give you the strength to say no to some things, but also the strength to say yes to some things. What a beautiful thing it is, is that we have this weapon at our disposal, a faith, a kind of faith, that will walk us through obedience. This pastor, I want every marriage in this, in this auditorium to win. I want every young person, listen to me, I, 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 I reject the lie that young people have to have a season outside the church in order for them to know what's inside the church. I reject that. I believe that you can know God at a young age, and I believe that you can serve him all of your days. I still believe in, in ready for this one? This might be shocking to some of you. I still believe that sons and daughters of this house can get married as virgins. I know that might shock some of you, but I still believe it. I still believe young people have the ability in their disciplines. There's no, there's no junior Holy Spirit. There's no junior Christianity. Uh, there's, listen to me, there's no, there's no special request for introverts or extroverts in the Bible. Ooh, that one's tough. As my wife is an introvert, and she'll talk to me about this after the service. That if, if the Lord, I, I, I'll never forget, Brooke, would you come back to the keyboard? I'll never forget the first moment that I lifted up my hand in a church service. I, I went to, I, I mean, it wasn't literally this, but I went to a church that, I mean, they swung off the chandeliers growing up. I mean, it, not literally. There was, it, to say that, I think, disparages a lot of what um, my home church did. I mean, they, they did things decency and in order, and, and my pastor was, was my hero, took my family in, loved us. Um, but that church was rocking, man. They, they, they believed in spiritual gifts. They believed in signs and wonders. And I remember there was times when my childhood pastor would get the microphone and he would say, well, that wasn't it this morning. We missed the mark. And then everyone that like, touched the microphone that service felt really bad, but he was going to call it like he saw it, balls and strikes. I appreciated that kind of candor. But I'll, I'll never forget, I was, man, 14, 13, 14 years old, standing next to my dad and the power of, the power of God hit the auditorium. And you know, young people are a good barometer because they're not going to fake I went to a church with my wife one time, and, and I leaned over to her, and I said, I said, um, hey, raise your hand. This is really uncomfortable. You're not, like, really worshiping. And she goes, I'm not giving them a token hand raise. <laughs> Presence of God's not here. I'm not going to do a token hand raise. <laughs> Me, on the other hand, I'll raise my hand. You know, it's, it's all good. But young people are that barometer. I, I ministered to young people for 20 years. Young people are that barometer where you know that they're not going to fake if the presence of God's in the room, the presence of God. But I was 13 or 14 years old, and I remember um, this was my hand raise. Ready? And it took everything. Everything that I had. I felt embarrassed, my flesh. I felt insecure. And I, and I sat in the back when I did it so that no one could see it. I'll never forget, man. It was just like my obedience. So I, I wish that men would lift up holy hands everywhere. My obedience to that as a teenager was this. And I'll never forget the anointing that I felt when I, when I told my flesh what to do, not the other way around. Like, Lord, I just want you. And if this is some sign of surrender to you, Lord, I just want it. And then I'll never forget, like three or four months later, it, it turned from this to this. And then it turned from that to this. I love you. Because in a relationship, as you get closer, the more love that comes, the less insecurity you have. I'll never forget when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, I, 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 if this is from you, I want it. If it's not from you, I don't want it. I remember being like freaked out and scared, the introvert, the shy kid. I remember sitting in the back saying, Lord, if you want to fill me, you got to fill me right here because I'm not going forward. And I don't want anyone praying for me. I don't want anyone screaming in my ear. I don't want anyone spitting all over me while they're praying for me. I just want to sit in the back. And it was like something welled up in me that was already there that I just tapped into. And dear God, my life has never been the same again. When you think, 
when you think, when you think about the goodness of God and walking in obedience, just walking in obedience. This message is less about spiritual gifts and using those as an example. This message is less about a style of a church. There's many great churches that that disagree on on from this pastor on on the spiritual giftings that are available, and they're just as more part of body of the Christ than we are. There's no hierarchy. You listening to this pastor? There's no hierarchy. I said this before and I'll say it again. Who cares if you speak in tongues if you gossip in English? <laughs> like there's a there's a lot of things that are really important in this life and the giftings that God gives us are secondary to his fruits. But I felt like I was supposed to just have a conversation with my church, my church family. I believe that God wants to do something special in our midst. But the anointing is freely given when there's an openness to say, Lord, there's nothing off limits and I want to walk as, as an obedient child to you and your ways. So I don't know what it is for you. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's this hand raise or standing up and feeling uncomfortable. I, 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 it's you. And I, and I believe that you're going to give the best response that you know how to. Some of us are going to be able to come forward and kneel. Some of us as a church family. But here's what I feel like we should do as a church family when this kind of message comes so I can be plain. Is to do something maybe a little bit beyond your own comfort zone. And if you're used to this, give the Lord this. Because it is a kingdom lesson that the spirit man is to put in check the carnal flesh man. That's why I think the altars are so important. As I, as I went this morning in worship and walked the whole six steps. Because Lord, I need your help. This pastor who's, who's serving a church... I can't do it on my own. Husbands, you're not going to lead your family on your own. You're not going to raise godly children in this, in this world on your own. If your kids never see you humbled before God or with a hand raised or a tear coming down your cheek, if they've never seen your example of what it means to humble yourself before God, what does that say about you? For me, Lord, there's nothing off limits in my life. I pray over my boys when they're down here. I'll grab them and give them a hug. And they, you know, my 11-year-old's like, get off me, Dad. To walk in obedience is what it's going to take to be the conduit of his anointing that breaks strongholds in this community. And so my encouragement to you is to receive this word from the Lord from your pastor. And I say, Lord, I give you permission this week to make me uncomfortable. I give you permission, Lord, to convict me in the areas of my attitude, my actions, my heart. Lord, there's nothing off limits in my life because I want to be a part of a church that welcomes you and your move more than anything. Would you stand to your feet all across this room? We have a few minutes left, maybe 10 or so minutes. The worship team is going to lead us back in worship. But I'd encourage you men... Would you lead your families to a place of, of surrender? Would you come down front? Would you gather them in, in your, around where you're seated? Would you turn your pew into an altar? I don't know what you want to do, but to say, Lord, if you find me, I want you to find me in faith, believing that the promises of God are for me and they're coming, and I want you to find me at a place of obedience. Because, Lord, I'm thankful for your salvation, but I'm also thankful that you conquered the tomb so that I can have your victory. Matter of fact, would you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this room, you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God this morning, and I need to take the first step. I need to get my heart right with Jesus. I, re I recognize that he's calling. He's, he's, he's drawing me into a real relationship with him, and I recognize this morning by the sermon, it's not just going to be this flip it, flip it yes, but I'm recognizing that I'm saying yes to being a disciple of Jesus, that his ways are going to be higher than my ways. His thoughts are are going to be higher than my thoughts and that I know that I'm going to need to walk in obedience to what he would say. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed all across this room. You say, Pastor, it's me. I need to get my heart right with the Lord. Would you stretch up your hands so I can see it? 
Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. I see your hands up there, yes. Hands went up everywhere. There's probably 10 or 12 or 13 people. I see your hands there, yes. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, it's me. I want to make sure that my heart's right before you. Yes. Church, would you put your hand over your heart and and just as a sign of, of unity with these new brothers and sisters in Christ, would you repeat this prayer after me alongside of them? Say, Dear Lord, today I recognize my need of you. I'm all in with you. Everything that I am for everything that you have for me. I thank you for what your son did on that cross that allowed the forgiveness of my sins. And so, Father, I repent. I choose to serve you. I recognize you're not after perfection. You're just after surrender. So everything that I am, for everything that you are, would you become Lord and Savior of my life? Yes. 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 Yes, Parkway, would you join heaven in giving the biggest round of applause you've given in a long time? Welcoming. Hallelujah. 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 We celebrate with you. We have um, some members of our yes team. If you're new to the faith, maybe you're making a rededication and you would like someone to walk alongside of you, uh, we have some people that would love to. Um, I know that the yes team, we train them to keep their eyes open while everyone bows their heads. I'm sure they've, they've seen you. So don't be startled when someone comes up to you and just says, hey, we're here for you if you want to exchange phone numbers. We've got a couple of them right here and right now. There's Jimmy and Dee Dee and Jim and Retta and you know, Keith is back there. Um, just don't be startled, but they're here for you. And if you'd like to, some more prayer, but just before, just before we close in the next seven minutes, seven or so minutes, would you find yourself at a place of surrender before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I want to be obedient to your ways. I want to be, be obedient to, to, to knowing and walking in the conviction that you want me to walk in. And then I'll get up and close this at the end. But Brooke, would you lead us in a couple of songs? Would you guys find a new place? Find a place at the altar? Thank you.
It's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. Your fire, the refiner, I want to be consumed. Your fire, the refiner, Lord, I want to be consumed. Clean my hands, so clean my hands. Your
you guys can just learn how to worship without a song being sung would you just take 60 seconds and stretch up your hands and just out of your own mouth and your own heart just say lord we honor you we worship you we glorify you like the Holy Spirit wanted me to take this final moments and kick the enemy completely out of our church. And let me, let me explain. Whenever uh, I'm learning this, I'm in, I'm in process. I'm a, a first time lead pastor and I can't say that anymore because I've been necessarily doing it for 18 months. What I've learned is the anxiety of a new pastor coming in with a new congregation and change is always, can be always uncomfortable. 
I just want you to know my heart. I'm not after, I'm not after trying to replicate my childhood church. I'm not after trying to replicate what God did in my life through my wife and I's ministry 20 years ago, nor, nor is anyone in this church saying that, Pastor, we just want you to come and continue what's been here for 70 years. When God calls a congregation to a new place, it's new not just for the congregants, it's new for the pastor. And we gotta be careful that we don't pigeonhole God and say, God, it's gotta look like it looked like yesterday or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I believe what God is wanting to do is something new and something fresh and something exciting because it's new. None of us have ever been on operation together. And it's gonna look different. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna have different kinds of expressions, but that doesn't mean that it's not gonna be rooted in the Word of God. And it's not gonna be rooted in the truth that the Holy Spirit is never going to be um, the number one position. It's, the Holy Spirit points to Jesus and what he did on that cross and what he did in that tomb. And the Holy Spirit now becomes our friend and our companion. If, if When you think about the Holy Spirit active in our life, he has been there since the beginning. So when you talk to the Holy Spirit, you're talking to a friend that's seen creation in Genesis chapter 1. He's, he's been there from the beginning. And so to have the Holy Spirit present in our church and in our life is basically inviting the person that creates the atmosphere that honors God and points to Jesus. What an incredible thing that is. And so I want you to know, in this solemn moment, what God is doing is it's new and it's exciting, but it will always, always be rooted back into what the Word of God. And I want to thank you as your pastor for allowing me to prod you, to, to push you uh, to, to something that I know the church isn't really accustomed to coming down to an altar, accustomed to even staying 15 or 20 minutes after the message. And I want to thank you from my heart that you've allowed me to push you guys to a place of of creating a space to meet face to face with God. And I want you to know that I'm doing the same. I have learned so much from you. The conversations that I've had with you, the the, the conversations that, that you know you guys have welcomed in private about, hey, Pastor, not everyone sees the way that you see. And that doesn't mean that they don't have a deep relationship with the Lord. I'm thankful that what God is doing here is based out of love and humility and kindness. But I will with everything inside of me, stand on the Word of God. And if the Word of God says to create space for the giftings that are found in His church, I'm responsible as the pastor to, to create a space for the giftings to be involved in the church. And that's the journey that we're gonna, we're gonna walk in. But even outside of what happens in, in the doors corporately, privately, whatever He says to do, we are to be found in obedience that we're not to use this tongue for slander, we're not to use this tongue for gossip, we're not to use this, this, the, these hands for evil doing or these feet to walk in places we shouldn't walk. But Lord, would you create in us, in this church, men and women of God who with their life don't just have deep knowledge, but have deep, deep obedience. Would you just uh, one time before we close sing holy, this as a congregation, just tell him how grateful we are that he came and spent a few moments with us. Lord, you're holy. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you were lifted high, holy. Facebook this week that said there's a fine line between a pastor's message and a hostage situation. <laughs> and 
I don't ever want to take hostages in church. But my wife and the band are going to continue to play just for a few moments. If you feel like you need to be dismissed, you're dismissed. If you need prayer, we're going to make ourselves available up here. This pastor loves you. What God is doing is such a unique and incredible thing. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for people giving their heart to Jesus in the last couple of weeks, uh, 12 or 13 today. Um, get a part of the Yes Team. Find a place to serve. Get baptized coming up. What an incredible thing that would be. But this pastor loves you. If you need prayer, we're going to stick around. They're going to keep singing. But we love you. God bless. You were lifted up.